What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah, and as you can tell by my beautiful backdrop, this is Funk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own Dynasty show. And it's a little different this time because I'm going to hit the intro, which is not the norm around here. Mike hopefully won't cut me off on that part, as I do with Nick. But um, as always on these videos, we have my man Mike at Mike Me Up on Twitter. He's going to be linked in the description below. You'll see his name below his beautiful face. Mike, how are we doing today after this Super Bowl Sunday? Doing good, man. Ready to get uh, get into the off season, man. This is the best time of the year. It is the best time of the year. There's no there's no time crunch. You can do whatever you want. You can put out content. You can't be proven wrong for a couple months. It's, it's really <laughs> living the dream, you know. Yeah. But today is the perfect example of why we can't be proven wrong. It's a dynasty video, and we're gonna be talking about risers and fallers, guys who throughout this season have either accrued a ton of value, like a Roth IRA. Or guys who have fallen off the map, like one of J. Cole's songs on KOD. That album, <laughs> trash. Um, <laughs> so a, a couple of the names just for the SEO value thrown in in the first couple of minutes. We got A.J. Brown, Allen Robinson, Austin Eckler, Baker Mayfield, who's looking like the Pillsbury Doughboy nowadays. So uh, we, got, we got a bunch of names on here, a bunch of guys that we're going to tell you whether, in our opinion, you should buy, sell, or hold, and whether or not their rise or their fall is really warranted based on what they did this past season. You know, Dynasty is more of a long-term you should have more of a long-term view, in my opinion. I think too much is being weighted on seasons, like this past season or partial seasons, when you should kind of be looking towards the future and past trends and seeing how that can help you towards the future, obviously. So without dragging this on too long, um, I think it's time to hit the intro. Hit it. All right, first up on this list, we got our man, Brandon Cooks, a short wide receiver out of L.A. He's been in multiple cities, and he's been pretty good in all of them, right? Um, this past year in September, he was going as the 28th player off the board and the wide receiver 14. Nowadays, um, as per his January ADP, he was actually 78th off the board, so falling from the third round all the way to the seventh, I believe, and from wide receiver 14 down to wide receiver 38. And if you're going to make the argument that you don't want him because of his concussions, I can't blame you. I'm not a doctor. I don't know how his brain is working now. I'm not so sure if his longevity is really there. But from what I've heard from him, at least, and what you see in the media, obviously people are talking about him retiring. But everything he said is that he plans to continue playing. And he suffered two concussions this year. One didn't hold him out when it probably should have. And then the second one, obviously, maybe he didn't have enough time to get healthy. That one recurred. Um, and then he sat out for a couple of games this season later on. So, but the fact that he hasn't talked about retirement makes me a little bit optimistic. So um, if that's the point you want to argue, I have no counter argument, so we can end that there. But I think the other more important topic and one that's more fantasy relevant and something that we can actually break down and is also a driver for his fantasy value plummeting is people think that he one isn't like good anymore, which I think just straight off the bat, you can say is stupid and it's dumb and, I mean, he's a first-round talent, and he's put up four straight 1,100-plus yard-from-scrimmage seasons on three different teams. You can't be Kelvin Benjamin and do that. Like, you have to be a good receiver to be able to do that. Um, and I think second is the fact that we saw the Rams go to more two tight end sets down the stretch, right? Um, we remember – I know Gerald Everett got injured, and I think that's some dude like, like Munt or something, but there was like a D thrown in there. I, I don't understand, but um, they had Tyler Higby, who they like signed to a max deal. Um, and they were running two tight end sets a lot. But we look at weeks one through four when Brandon Cooks was actually healthy. And, of course, it's a small sample, but we saw the entire 2018. They were basically uh, the poster child for three receiver sets. So weeks one through four, they ran for, uh, two tight end sets only 7% of the time, which is by far the least in the entire league. Then weeks five through 17, obviously a bigger sample, but it came after Brandon Cooks' first uh, concussion. And after that, he was still playing in weeks five through 17. He got injured later on but his snap share like heavily declined um, in those weeks. They actually had a 47%. Uh, they ran two tens, two tight end sets 47% of the time, which only trailed Philadelphia. And obviously they did it because their only like weapons were tight ends. And I think that has to do a lot with not only the fact that the Rams wanted to run a little bit more down the stretch. They talked about getting Todd Gurley more involved on the ground. And the fact that their offensive line was kind of garbage after the last Saffold and Andrew Whitworth was like starting to collect his AARP like a lot of things were going wrong for them. And I think, um, you know, we saw Josh Reynolds go out there more, who's a better blocker, but I'm not so sure that that is indicative of success with this team, because we look at what happened weeks one through four, 
they were three and one over that stretch and they were putting up almost 30 points a game. It was like 29.3 points a game weeks five through 17. They went six and six, which obviously isn't great. And of course they're in a tough division. So you expect them to drop a few games here and there, but their points per game dropped by almost a touchdown. They were at 23 points a game. And you could just tell that their offense wasn't functioning. Obviously Jared Goff isn't the best quarterback in the world, but when you put him in a situation where he loses a bunch of his playmakers and he's throwing to, you know, Higby and Munt sometimes and like Todd Gurley out of the backfield, the team as a whole isn't going to be as good as they should be. And I think to say that Brandon Cooks just all of a sudden isn't going to be part of this offense because we saw them use two tight ends when basically they were forced into doing that because, you know, Josh Reynolds isn't the best receiver. They wanted to block more when he was out there and they wanted to run the ball because they knew that the guy that they had relied upon the previous season, the guy who had 120 receiving yards in the Super Bowl, the biggest game of the season, he was an integral part of that offense, wasn't, you know, he couldn't be a part of that offense because of health concerns. And I think with a full offseason, like concussions aren't something that you should, you should have too much worry about if the guy doesn't sustain it. You know, it's not an injury he's probably going to sustain for the next four, five, six, seven months heading into the season. It's not like a torn ACL where the guy has to rehab over and over again. At least, at least not until they retire. And then, uh, yeah. and then you got to look up for your kids. Jordan, Jordan, Co- the Jordan Reed is still running around out there. And so is Marquise Goodwin. And those guys have like three times as many apiece. So, um, yeah, I'm not too concerned that if he does enter the season, if it's on this team or not, if he gets traded because he is, you know, costing this team a lot of money. I'm not so sure he wants to pick up that contract. But if he does end up somewhere else or even if he does land in L.A. again, I'm not so sure we can just write him off as being, you know, even if it's a borderline wide receiver two, wide receiver three. At 26 years of age, and a guy who we've seen produce year in and year out when given the opportunity, and that's exactly what's going to happen if he's healthy heading into 20 or 2020 at this point. Um, I don't think that his value, at, like where it is, is warranted because we look at what he did over those first four weeks just on a pace basis. And obviously it's a small pace, but it's basically online with what he's done in the past. It'll be 76 catches, um, 16 yards shy of 1,200 yards, and four touchdowns on 124 targets. The entire offense was cooking. The other three big playmakers, Gurley, Woods, and Cooper Cup were all on pace for well over a thousand yards from scrimmage. So the entire offense was eating. He was eating along with them. And I think just to say that he's no longer a part of this team because of a trend we saw because of confounding variables um, isn't really smart analysis, in my opinion. All right, we get it. You love Brandon Cooks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pretty long-winded, but I had I had to drive that point home. Uh, and so look, I mean, I think I think for his for his cost, you, you, he's a good buy. Um, in terms of the record, though, the, the challenge is, like, if you look at who they played, um, so I think in the first four weeks they played against Carolina uh, with Cam, who basically couldn't throw the ball. They blew out New Jericho, Orleans. So that's, that's fair. They blew out New Orleans. Uh, they played the Browns, who we know are trash, and then they lost versus Jameis' 30-for-30 30 interception, <laughs> uh, Tampa Bay Bucks. So it was definitely an easier schedule. And then once they got into the tough part of their schedule, they just started taking L's like no tomorrow. So I think the overall team is, is definitely taking a step back. Um, you kind of brought this up, but they, the Rams were the number one team running in 11 personnel. So that means like three wide receiver sets. And they just couldn't do it anymore because Jared Goff was getting completely obliterated. And we all know Jared Goff under pressure folds like a lawn chair. So you got to get those two tight ends out there to block. Um, so I think that's, that might be a trend going forward because they don't have any room in any draft picks to improve that O-line because Les Snead has basically taken that team and ran into the ground and mortgaged their future without investing in the actual real pieces. You don't like them investing in 25-year-old running backs, like 40 million <laughs> a year, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Can you find me one running back contract that's worked out so far for the team that's actually – I cannot. Whatever uh, role where he most starts getting paid is working out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think going forward, I mean, it's definitely a risk, but having said that, the cost is I mean, the cost is a no-brainer because you're getting him basically for pennies, and we've seen what his ceiling can be. I do think that Roger, uh, not Roger, sorry, Rob Bobby Woods is probably the guy to own on that offense. He's super cheap as well. He's like price set outside of wide receiver two, even though he's basically a fringe wide receiver one. Um, but given the upside, I mean, I, I'm, I'm on board with you. You should probably buy. I don't think he's a bad football player. It's just a bad circumstance. Yeah, and the start I just did, and I'm pretty sure like this is gonna be a common trend, just falling down the boards. I think I got him in the middle of the tenth round, which yeah. like, around J, not JJ Arcega White side, he's like eleventh, but like in that same conversation, the risk of taking a Brandon Cooks is a lot less than taking a guy who literally has never done anything in this league, or even like if you can flip a mid second round rookie pick for him, 
like the chances of you hitting on that is almost like as little as Bernie Cook's not hitting his head. So, I mean, you got to, you got to take into consideration. There's a lot of return on investment that you could get. You obviously could get a dud out of him and he may never play again, but the investment that you're making to get a potential like wide receiver to a guy who's put up, you know, thousand yard seasons over and over and over again is huge. Now you just can't pass up on that price in my opinion. Yeah. And he's not going anywhere. He's got a $21 million dead cap in 2020, 13 million next year. So, I mean, like I said, Les need has totally took a dump on that entire team. I don't, I don't see what they're going to do for the next two, three years, but we'll see. Uh, but he's not going anywhere. He's tied to, he's tied to them. Another guy that might be tied up in a contract. I know you have is up next. Yeah, we got the rushing champion, Max Animals, hashtag freak athlete, Derek Henry. That name's like Voldemort on this channel. You're like not a <laughs> lot to say. Yeah, definitely not a big dog favorite. Uh, not even a favorite for for myself. But, I mean, we can't deny the production that he's had. Uh, he has workhorse volume. He's the league leader in rushing attempts and rushing yards. And he's not just – getting the volume he's also been very efficient you know he's number two in big plays we know Henry breaks the big plays all the time uh, and he's learning to break tackles I mean I remember I didn't like him before because he was like a 256 pound monster and he would try and juke like little defenders I'm like what are you doing dude just like truck them and I think he's like kind of learned to do that and you see it translate to production on the field he's number one in yards created like, they just can't bring this dude down. And he basically owns the entire Jacksonville secondary, adopted them last year, and continues to own them this year. So I think um, there's no denying that he's good, okay? So those are all the positives. Uh, oh, the last one is that he has a top five run-blocking O-line. And I looked into all their contracts earlier today, and four out of five of them are returning. The other one is an unrestricted free agent, but they also have a fifth-year option. So they have, to, they have the potential to bring back all five starters, which is huge uh, going forward. So those are the good things. The bad things, uh, he's he's old as fuck uh, for a <laughs> dynasty running back. Okay, so he's uh, people don't know this. You know, people kept saying that he's 25 years old. Uh, I was like, dude, you guys realize how calendars in a year works, right? He was born in January. He's about to be 26 in one month. So he's going to be 26.9 at the start of the next season. He'll be 27 by the end. So going beyond that, you'll be looking at a 28 year old running back. And I know people say he doesn't I like have. That. I like how you're aging him real quick. He's like he's 26 yeah. now. He's about to be 28. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I'm just I'm looking for one year, two years in advance, and I think he'll still produce, right? So I'm not. This is not me saying that he's gonna suck. I think he'll produce. He's good. There's no doubt that he's really good. But in terms of dynasty, you want to try and time your sales. And for me, I'm always about trying to look to get out a year early versus a year late because. You can sell him now for, you know, incredible value, like top five rookie pick, refresh at the new, uh, refresh at your running backs and maybe even get something else on top. Um, whereas like two years from now, you know, you're looking at like Devontae Freeman, Love Bell type situations, right? Those are not situations you want to be in. The, the bad thing is obviously he still has zero involvement in the running game. Uh, he ranks 49th out of all running backs and receptions which is wild because he's the lead dog. And for some reason, they don't like throwing him screens, even though he's incredible at screens. So I don't know what's going on there. Uh, if they start up in his volume there, I'll probably change my mind. But for now, he's there's, he's shown nothing to tell me that he's going to be involved in the passing game. And then the, the killer is, I don't know if you saw the interview with, uh, I think it was Rich Eisen or something. And he said, so where does the contract negotiation start? Is it like at Zeke? He's like, yeah, it starts at Zeke. So Jesus Christ. Uh, That's why I always hated him for a reason. <laughs> you're going to be paying a floor of of Zeke's contract, and we all know how that worked out for Dallas Cowboys. Uh, we'll, I mean, we'll talk about this topic a little bit on a little bit later on, but definitely not good. And then the last thing I'll say is the Titans had incredible red zone efficiency this year. Um, I think, who was it? It was uh, Z JJ Zach uh, Zacharyson, um, the late-round QB on Twitter. He put out this stat basically after Tannehill took over. The Titans converted on 31 of 32 touchdowns on trips to the end zone. Uh, just to give you a sense of how crazy that is, the next closest team was at a 4-to-1 ratio. So that's not something that you expect to sustain in the long run. So there's going to be team-level regression, and at least I expect it. And then there's going to be TD regression for Henry because he's achieving a well above league, both league average and his own historical averages. So there's just a lot of things that are going against him. And even with all of that, he was a rushing champ. He scored 18 touchdowns, and he was still the RB5, right? So, like, you need everything to go right for him to hit that ceiling. So, for me, it's like 
this is like the perfect time to sell where I can trade down and get more youth and maybe get a couple other random picks that I can use as darts. Um, so, but that's usually how I approach the running back position as a whole anyways. Yeah. For Derek Henry, I know early in the season, Nick and I kind of trashed him. Well, not even early in the season, basically like the entire four months that fantasy football was going on. We were just completely off of Derek Henry and touching on those like touchdowns that he scored, even with Mariota early in the season, I think like five of his first six touchdowns were on the one yard line and they happened because of penalties in the end zone. Like the ball got advanced to the one. And I know we've brought up this point like ad nauseum and I put up like tweets and pictures of them getting the ball at the one. And Derek Henry just tips over like a tow truck and he just, he scored from there. And obviously if they keep getting those opportunities, he's going to score from one, one yard out when you're 260 and you run a four or five and you can just accelerate like that. But the point is like, how often can we really expect that to happen? Right. They run, like they try to dominate time of possession which is, I mean, it helps their running game a lot. Uh, I'm not so sure that they're going to be able to keep up the amount of times that they do run. And even if they do, like, he's an unrestricted free agent. Are we not sure that they're just going to add somebody through the draft and just move on from Derrick Henry? I know Chris Johnson was in an interview with somebody, and he was talking about why they hadn't paid uh, Derrick Henry to that point. And I think it was sometime in late December. They're like, I just don't think the team trusts him. Not so much like his production, but his work ethic. I know that he was talking about early in his career with um, DeMarco Murray when he was still ahead of him, even though like DeMarco Murray's last year, he was completely awful. Um, Derrick Henry still couldn't overtake that job. It was not because of a lack of skill, really. It was like a lack of work ethic. I guess that's what Chris Johnson was saying. So um, I don't understand why, if they were going to pay him, why they hadn't done it yet, especially with how well he helped them out um, in the playoffs. Like he was basically the main driver of this offense, but uh, you hit the nail on the head perfectly. This guy has seen so many touches. He's a huge frame. I'm not so sure how well that like holds up on his knees. I'm not sure if there's any studies for that, but you always want to get out of these guys like a few years before they really start to tank. And if you can net like a top three to top five pick and get even like not even like Clyde Edwards Hillier might be stretching, but like a Cam Akers, a J.K. Dobbins, if it's a super flex league, you can probably move it down to like the 106 and get a legit running back who's going to be picked in the first or second round and probably, you know, return as much uh, value as Derrick Henry is going to return over the next two seasons while also adding on to the shelf life that Derrick Henry doesn't have at this point. Yeah, yeah, you bring up a great point. Like, he's an unrestricted free agent. I mean, there's no – I mean, there's no guarantee that they don't just, like, franchise tag him and then he holds out too. So, given the recent trends of people holding out for money, that's definitely not out of the realm of possibility. So, you got to just keep those risks in mind. And with how deep this class is, like who's going to be wanting to pay Ezekiel Elliott money for him? And if he does spend a weekend in Cancun, he's going to come back at like 350 pounds. So I'm not, I'm not too sure I'm going to be holding out hope if he doesn't get signed by Tennessee that he's going to just walk into a workhorse role elsewhere because that's a ton of money to put into an older running back that, as you said, is 26 now and is about to be 28, which means he's about to be 30 sometimes. Yep. Sticking with this team, uh, young guy out of Tennessee from Ole Miss, we got A.J. Brown. Um, obviously the wide receiver um, he was 70th overall back in September off the board now he's 23rd and he went from wide receiver 35 all the way up to wide receiver 11 and I want to start off by saying just like what we said with Derrick Henry this guy is just phenomenal at football he's a big athletic freak that wins before the catch wins after the catch wins at the catch point uh, he was sixth in the entire league this year in yards after the catch which is absolutely incredible given the limited volume that he had I didn't have the numbers for his yards after catch per reception, but I'm sure it's up there because of the lack of receptions he had and the uh, pure, like, immense amount of yards he did have after the catch. Uh, and on top of that, he put up some crazy numbers. He had over 1,000 yards on less than 100 targets, which only 13 receivers have done and no rookie receiver has ever done in this entire league. And another point for his fantasy production, right, he showed a fairly high ceiling week after week down the stretch, and it was fairly consistent, right? He finishes a top 12 wide receiver 31.3% of the time, which I believe is five out of 16 weeks, which for a wide receiver that didn't play 70% of the snaps until week 10, that is incredible. And I know he started off hot out the gate. I think he had like a three catch and a hundred yard uh, performance week one. And right after that, I kind of fell in love with him. I mean, I loved him coming into the NFL and heading into the draft, but that just reinvigorated my love for him because I wasn't sure he was going to be able to, you know, escape those cold dead hands that Marcus Mariota has and, that he can't throw a ball with. But then we saw Ryan Tannehill come in, and this team completely turned it around. But I'm not so sure that with Tannehill, even him under center, is going to work out for A.J. Brown in the long run. Not that I don't think he can return value of wide receiver 11, because we saw him do that this year. But for fantasy purposes, especially if you're betting on the future, a team that is practically built on just killing clock, um, dominating time possession, running the ball out, relying on their defense, just basically everything we saw them use in the playoffs this year to bring them to 
you know, play against the Chiefs and, you know, barely lose in that game. Um, everything that they're built on doesn't really work into A.J. Brown's favor. I mean, we saw him be fairly boom bust. I know those highs were super high, but those lows were also extremely low. And that can also be kind of rationalized away by his low snap share and the fact that he was a rookie. But still, even in the games that he was playing, there was a couple of games where you kind of expected him to blow up and he just did nothing. I mean, he put up less than 10 fantasy points 50% of the time, which is obviously a low floor. He finished outside the top 36, 43.7% of the time, which is, I know, probably seven out of 16 games, I would say. Uh, quick math off the top of my head. And in all the games he finished as a top 12 receiver, they came against bottom nine pass grades, uh, pass defenses per PFF. And obviously, you know, you're probably starting him in those games, so you expected that type of production. But for a guy who was only really producing when, you know, the matchup arose and when it was more of a pass funnel defense for him to produce, like it was against Houston twice, he had two huge games against Oakland. Those were teams that were much better against the run than they were against the pass, and that opened up the opportunity for A.J. Brown to blow up. I mean, if you have to rely on that year after year for A.J. Brown to return wide receiver 11 value, I'm not so sure with the limited volume in this offense, that's something you can hang your hat on. And just looking at how well his team um, worked with Ryan Tannehill under center, obviously they won a ton of games in a row and they, they made that playoff push and they made it basically almost to the Super Bowl. In the nine games that uh, Ryan Tannehill played and won in, he threw, guess how many times he threw over 30 times in those games? Zero. Zero. Once. Oh, wow. I think More it's in the playoffs. Guess how many times he threw over 25 times a game? It's probably still once or twice. Thrice. So basically one third of the time he was having, you know, extremely low end, but, you know, I guess passable, no pun intended, no passable production throwing the ball. But even if A.J. Brown gets that 25 to 30 percent target share on 25 attempts, a 30 percent target share is what, seven and a half targets. That's, That's nothing. Not right. Elite wide receivers like in Allen Robinson or Cooper Cup, um, they're not even elite, but those are guys getting picked behind them. Those guys are seeing, you know, 130, 140, 150 targets. If A.J. Brown is only seeing 110 because of the offense he's in, and not to mention, like, as you said, their offensive line is locked up under contract. They have a good defense. I guess they have Tannehill as a decent enough quarterback. What's to say they don't add more weapons in the receiving game so it's not all just everything isn't all on A.J. Brown's plate. Johnny Smith gets um, used a little bit more. That 25% target share that he saw with Ryan Tannehill could drop down to 20, and the volume just keeps going down from there. And it's not like he can't produce on limited volume. I mean, we saw him do it this year, right? He did most of his yards after the catch, and we saw him, you know, completely eat on limited volume. But, like, if you're betting on the future and you can, like, get a good return for him, for somebody that you know is going to at least get the volume, maybe not be as efficient on it, but you know the volume will bump up those numbers. I mean, you got to kind of – he's not an untradable asset in that sense. And I know next week or in a few weeks we're going to be talking about touchdown sustainability – I think A.J. Brown is a prime candidate to regress in that uh, department because four of his eight receiving touchdowns came from 50-plus yards out. He was basically the Saquon Barkley of receivers. And sure, that is a part of his game, and he does dominate after the catch. But can you really expect like half of his production, half of his valuable production, to come off of either broken plays or plays where he li like literally does it all himself? And he isn't like heavily involved in the red zone where you know the percentage chance of him scoring is obviously going to be higher from closer in. He had eight red zone targets his entire season. It was a 16% share on his own team. And for a team that passed only 47.3% of the time in the red zone, the sixth lowest rate in the NFL, I mean, nothing, none of these numbers are good for A.J. Brown in terms of volume. Now, he could just completely prove me wrong and be extremely efficient. I'd love if he proved me wrong because I'm a huge fan of his. But if we're talking fantasy football and we're talking about predictability and production going forward, the fact that he's wide receiver 11 when you can get Allen Robinson I think it's like wide receiver 17 and like a round or two later. And probably, I don't even know, like in a startup I did, I think A.J. Brown went like third and Allen Robinson went seventh round. That disparity is ridiculous. And I know Allen Robinson's an older player, but you're still getting three, four years out of A-Rob's prime and getting a lot in return if you can pull off a trade. Like, would you take A-Rob and a first round pick for A.J. Brown right now? 100%. Like a, even a late, like a 112. Yeah, I would take it in a heartbeat. And I don't think that's an unrealistic offer to, you know, test the waters with throw A.J. Brown and see what you can get in return. And if that's something that you can net for a guy who, you know, we believe in the talent, but the situation isn't necessarily there. And I guess you could argue that was the case last year and we would have gotten proven wrong with that type of analysis. But um, just looking forward, I'm not so sure that he he deserves to be the wide receiver 11 um, per ADP just because of the lack of volume he might see in an offense that's built basically around their defense.
Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, you pretty much covered it. I think we, uh, I don't have too much to add. I like a bunk, but I love that. You, like, you covered it pretty much. But, like, just, I think it's just recency bias, right? I mean, people just want to see what they want to see. I mean, the big thing I'll say is, you know, in the time that I've been playing fantasy, which isn't that long, I mean, but in the time that I've been watching, the making the transition from the wide receiver two, which is what he was for the first half, maybe first two thirds of the year, to the wide receiver one from like an NFL defensive treatment perspective is a very hard transition to make. And very few make that transition really smoothly. And you saw him struggle when that happened this year, right? I mean, teams put uh, the Saints put Lattimore on him, Gilmore, uh, Patriots put Gilmore on him because they realized that he was the team's best threat and it was no longer Corey Davis. That's a transition that's hard to make, you know, and one of the things he does struggle with is like press man coverage. Uh, he doesn't have like the fastest like twitch moves to get open. So those are things he needs to work on. I believe that he'll, you know, I believe that he'll improve. I really like him. I really like him coming in, but I think his price right now assumes that he's already done that, which he has. So for me, I'd rather, like you said, if I get a deal of like a raw plus any 2020 first or even a 2021 first for AJ Brown, I'm doing it. Yeah, most people that own A.J. Brown are basically saying he's off the trade block. So if you are one of those people that has A.J. Brown, people like want to buy him at, based off what they saw. Yeah. Just, if you just watch a game with A.J. Brown, he's just fun to watch. He's like prime Josh Gordon just because he's that big build that wins after the catch. People want that on their fantasy teams. Even if they're going to overpay, they want players that they like to watch. And you yeah. can probably get a King's Ransom for a guy who you probably know in the back of your head may never hit this high again. And if he does, it's probably because – of he gets that immense volume, which at this point we know that the offense that they're running under the coach and the OC that they have isn't going to happen. So they need a lot to go right in terms of yeah. changes, which with the success they had probably isn't going to happen. You just don't want to, you don't want to prepay for volume. Like just, I mean, it's simple, right? You just don't want to prepay for volume. That's what people are doing. And I just don't do that. Um, the, let's just move on to the next one. The second one is, uh, is another wide receiver. Uh, probably one of my favorites. I know he was a favorite of Knicks coming into this year. And he disappointed in a big way. And it's Juju Smith-Schuster. Um, he's obviously, he started the year, I think, as the overall wide receiver two in September before the season. And now he's fallen to wide receiver seven, which isn't a huge fall. But when you're talking about the elite tiers, a fall of four to five spots is actually a decent drop in value. And in terms of, uh, in terms of his positional finish, he finishes like the wide receiver 60 plus because he missed a ton, he missed a ton of games and, he played with Duck Hodgins, who should obviously be a backup, and Mason Rudolph, who is basically a little bitch. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so I mean, well. <laughs> yeah, so there, this just was not a good situation for Juju. Um, but, I mean, aside from that, obviously there's a lot of knocks on him, right? The biggest knock on him is, oh, look, Antonio Brown's gone. He can't handle the wide receiver one role. Like, guys, get real, okay? We've seen him in a wide receiver one role, although in a very limited sample from 2017 to 2018 in three games without AB uh, and with Ben Roethlisberger, like Juju Smith-Schuster Juju Smith balled out. He had like 20 plus points per game um, and he was the true one and he was getting targeted a ton. So the problem is not Juju Smith-Schuster. And just although touching we on that, not to cut you off, but we saw a guy, Tyler Boyd, who I think we would argue is like, wouldn't even argue is an objectively worse football player this year, take on the wide receiver one duty and play that big slot role. You don't have to be, the most refined receiver to produce out of the slot role when you're 6'2", you work after the catch the way that Juju Smith-Schuster does. He doesn't have to be Antonio Brown to put up Antonio Brown numbers in this offense when you're the wide receiver one. So to say that because you're not a prototypical outside receiver threat, you can't handle quarterback ones, just uh, that's kind of you know bullshit because he doesn't necessarily always go up against the, uh, the cornerback ones, especially with the other guys that they have on this offense. Now he's not going to be tasked with facing you know, maybe Stefan Gilmore shadows him in the slot, but most top guys don't always travel into the slot. So that's kind of a that's kind of a yeah. low end argument to argue against Juju Smith Schuster. Yeah, I mean, and in the one game that he did play with Ben before Ben basically snapped his elbow, uh, in game one against New England, Juju Smith Schuster did go up against Gilmore and he had a game of six catch for seventy eight, which was almost identical to the line that A B would have put up uh, against Gilmore in the years past. So we know we can do it. And there's so many more positives, you know, like he's 23 years old. Just like get, get grasp that concept. He's 23 years old. He's got some of the most elite age adjusted NFL production in the history of the game, like on par with Randy Moss in terms of someone that young coming into the league and producing at that level. Right. He's three or four years out from hitting his prime. Uh, and 
we know that Duck Hodgins and that ball grabbing little bit bitch boy is not going to speed the success of this team moving forward, right? So we know Big Ben is supposed to return, and Big Ben loves Juju Smith-Schuster, right? He, I mean, they Juju loves Ben, Ben loves him, Ben loves targeting him, and we were looking for those elite types of volumes for Juju, and we think that's going to come next year. So this is a this is one that's a super easy buy for me, and I'm going to buy him everywhere. Uh, if you can get Juju Smith-Schuster for AJ Brown, I would do that so fast and never look back. He's basically AJ Brown with volume, and we've seen him do it for more than one season. We saw him do yeah. it on limited volume as a rookie, and we saw him do it with a ton of volume his second year in a more pass friendly offense in Pittsburgh with a running game that they can't trust their running back right now. I'm sure that they'll invest in one in the draft if they do. Um, but still, he's going to be a guy who's going to see, you know, that 130 plus targets this year and be an alpha wide receiver one. And I know Deontay Johnson looked really good, but do we actually think he's going to see more targets or more usage uh, down by the red zone or in any facet of the game than Juju Smith-Schuster? I think that's very short-sighted to, you know, believe that. Yeah, I mean, Juju Smith-Schuster was literally A.J. Brown before A.J. Brown was A.J. Brown. Juju Smith-Schuster was great after the catch, incredibly efficient with his touches, um, getting high-quality targets and producing at an elite level. So if you're, like, paying up for A.J. Brown thinking that he'll do it, why not just grab Juju Smith-Schuster, who we know can do it and has done it? And based on some of the stuff I've seen lately, like, he's going for, like, single 2020 first. Uh, so if you can get him for any 2020 first, um i'm jumping on that like fat kids on twix so you should be too as for like if this move down draft boards is warranted you think about it right you said he was the wide receiver too in i think september mm -hmm. what happened this year that made you just completely fall out of love with him he got injured sure everybody gets injured and big ben got hurt and he's old we know big ben is old and we know he's in a walking boot every other week nothing that you like you can't really rationalize him falling down the draft boards this far for the, like the only things that happened to him are basically commonalities when you play in the NFL. It's not like he's injury prone. And it's not like his situation got a whole hell of a lot worse. I'd actually argue it kind of got better because now we know, you know, if that argument was that he can't handle cornerback ones, his situation got better because he has, you know, guys that have proven this year that they can kind of take away um, some defensive focus off of Juju Smith-Schuster and kind of work by himself in the slot. So um, definitely dropping five wide receiver slots and basically one to two rounds or whatever it is um, in ADP is I think completely foolish. If you can get him for one 2020 first, that's a complete haul. If, even if you ask for like, you know, you give up a first and a player, like a John Ross or something, people that like that they're high on, you're still stealing him from whatever owner is giving him up. So yeah, he's somebody I'm super high on. Now, another guy I am super high on, even though his price has risen astronomically high. And I'm, I'm super excited because it's the only time we get to talk about the Chargers in a positive light. It's Austin Eckler. The little bald boy in L.A., formerly of San Diego. Now, he has risen very high up draft boards. He went from 119th overall in ADP in uh, September to 46th right now. So he's going inside the top four rounds. And he went from RB41 to RB18. And I'm here to argue that is not high enough. He is somewhat low. very low, just like his height measurement. But um, throughout the offseason, I was extremely high on him for redraft purposes just because – you know, I was high on him just as the player he was, but you just watch what the team did in the preseason and the commitment that they showed because I think a lot of people were scared off of him being a lead back because of what happened in 2018. You remember back, I think it was three games he started when Melvin Gordon sat. Those games were against Tennessee, that game in London where both teams legit ran 40 plays and it was disgusting to watch. Um, I think he also played Pittsburgh, another good run defense, and then he like killed Cincinnati as he should have. But those two out of the three games where he didn't produce, I think people were a little bit worried. Uh, he got banged up down the stretch, but I think it was on special teams with his neck. So I don't think that was really indicative of him not being able to handle a load. And then you head into this year, right, and you're afraid that he's going to be using the same role, being run up the middle just like Melvin Gordon was. But you realize that they actually had time to implement him into the offense. For 2018, Melvin Gordon was the guy, and Austin Eckler was nothing more than like a satellite back that would come out you know, once every couple third downs because Melvin Gordon's a, like a capable pass catcher. This year, they really schemed around him. They used him on the outside a ton in screen games. He caught, I think, over 90 passes. He was legitimately ridiculous. And the like the only negatives I can see about his profile, right, is the quarterback uncertainty. I know Phil Rivers loves to target the running back, especially recently because his arm is dead. He's also um, trash. So yeah, he's, he is terrible. And a lot of Chargers fans love him. What has he done to warrant any love? Whatever. I'm not going to get a lot of kids. He, had a lot of <laughs> he kids, does man. have a lot of kids. So he's, he's growing a village. He's growing a village out there. <laughs> he's got 11 like mandatory fans. 
And the other one is like, what if Melvin Gordon does return, right? They have the 12th most cap space and all they have to pay now that Philip Rivers is completely out of this, uh, out of the picture is Hunter Henry, Adrian Phillips, Michael Schofield, and then a bunch of like low rank guys like a Jalen Watkins, um, you know, a couple other guys that I don't even know their names right now because they're not really costing them a lot of money. So what if they do end up paying Melvin Gordon? I mean, they're about to give him a 10 year or four year, uh, 40 million for 10 a year. Um, Could you imagine? Could you imagine them back and like come Melvin Gordon coming back and like begging for that money? Like, have you ever seen two guys burn money faster than Le'Veon Bell and Melvin Gordon and be like, yeah, I'm going to hold out. And it's like, Oh shit, they're actually better than me. (laughs) Yeah. That, that was tough. It was a tough scene because he was wearing that TNF chain. So people thought he was going to come back on Thursday night football. And then he sees Austin Eckler just run wild. And he's like, okay, it was all kind of a social experiment. It was a prank. (laughs) This dude is actually legit. So I'm going to come back before he takes my job. (laughs) <laughs> well, guess what? Newsflash, Melvin. This guy has taken your job. And I do like Melvin Gordon, but it's it's to nobody's surprise that Austin Eckler is just a very good running back. All he's ever shown is efficiency. And if you want to argue that you're afraid of Melvin Gordon returning, hurting his value, we look at what he, what he's done these past two seasons when Melvin Gordon is active. This season, his pace with Melvin Gordon there, weeks 5 through 17, he was the RB8 over that span. He was on pace for 449 rushing yards. And then through the receiving game, 111 targets, 91 receptions, 964 yards, seven touchdowns. That's with Melvin Gordon there. And the dude played 45% or more of the snaps in 11 of 12 games. He proved to Anthony Lynn and everybody in that front office, in that coaching staff, that he belongs on the field. And when he was given opportunities, he was absolutely elite. And that's been over the past two seasons. I have splits to like put on the screen right now. You just see, I know you can't see it, Mike, but we'll just see that he's extremely efficient on the touches he gets. And even in limited volume, right? In the in-split you see with Melvin Gordon, he was averaging nearly 13 fantasy points a game. Obviously, it's a lot less than his 19 without him. But if you're concerned that like Melvin Gordon coming back completely destroys his values the RB18, all you have to do is look at his efficiency, right? In 2018, he averaged 1. 1. 1.28 fantasy points per touch. And this year, he averaged 1.17 fantasy points per touch. If we project him for 150 touches next year, that's like with Melvin Gordon back, and as we can see in the in-split column, he was like over 150. So it's a low-end conservative projection. He would have put up 192 points on his 2018 efficiency, which is the RB16, and 176 points on his uh, 2019 efficiency, which is the RB20. And obviously the efficiency went down because his volume went up. So to say that he's going to fall off the map because Melvin Gordon is going to, like if he does uh, return to LA, I think is you got to look a little bit deeper than that because he's one of the more efficient guys in this league. He's basically James White if James White knew how to run the ball and catch touchdowns. And I think that's a huge asset. And I know you're not supposed to always chase um, satellite backs, but in this offensive system, one that you know you can count on him catching, you know, 70, 80, 90 balls. And the upside that he has if he is the lead back on this team is absolutely incredible. And for the last counterpoint, just saying that um, you don't know what to expect if Philip Rivers is gone and you think he's the main like driver behind this RB targeting um, and the volume that they get in the passing game, we look at the trend that the Los Angeles Chargers have gone through since Anthony Lynn has gotten to, into town. Their pass percentage to the running back position has went from 23% to 27% to 32%. They ranked 10th in 2017, 3rd in 2018, and 1st in 2019 um, in targets to the running back position. So I don't think you should just say it's all Phillip Rivers, the reason why that they're thrown there. Anthony Lynn is a former running backs coach. He knows he wants to get Austin Eckler the ball. He obviously sees the talent there. Uh, and he knows when the ball's in his hands, he's going to do very good things. And if that's not ev- evidence enough, back in 2016, when Anthony Lynn was with the Buffalo Bills, legit all he had in the backfield was like, not even Carlos Williams. I think it was uh, LaShawn McCoy and Mike Gillisley. So LaShawn McCoy, he's like a capable pass catcher. He's not great. Mike Gillisley, I don't even know where that dude is at. Um, he targeted the running backs at the 10th highest clip in the league. So it's obviously a part of his game plan to get running backs used in the backfield. So whether or not Melvin Gordon is there, whether or not Philip Rivers is there, um, he's still going to return value as the RB18 because legitimately ever since 2018, that's all he's ever done despite who he's playing with. Yeah, again, I, don't, I mean, I don't have too much to add. I think that goes to good value. Um, he's, I mean, he finished as the RB2. Uh, a, <laughs> a lot of that came from the first half without Melvin Gordon, but he was still a very stable floor producer. I mean, I did a little bit of study on um, satellite backs, and my general approach is to fade them. 
especially the satellite backs that, that are super high production in one year because they very rarely repeat it. But with Eckler, I make an exception because there's a chance that he leads the backfield. I think that's the key. You have to have a path to lead the backfield in touches. And if Gordon isn't there, the path is there for him to do that because he's proven he can. Yeah, I think, I think the difference between like him and a guy like Tariq Cohen or James White is both teams, like they could have had the opportunity to use them as those lead backs and they didn't. With Austin Eckler, they had the opportunity to use him as a lead back and they did. So just going off your point, like if Melvin Gordon doesn't re-sign, I don't see how they pay another running back. They, they're just going to give Austin Eckler the lion's share of the touches. Yeah, exactly. He's a restricted free agent, so they can just put a tenant around him. It'll cost him a couple million bucks. Um, definitely good value. And another um, point that you brought up with um, Derrick Henry, his offensive line, right? I know they're not the best offensive line, but that's more so in the pass game. This past year, they actually ranked third or 13th in, a, in adjusted line yards, and that's with their left tackle, Russell Kuhn, missing basically more than half the season. And their center, Mike Pouncey, injured. And going back to 2018, they actually ranked fifth in adjusted line yards. And looking at the contracts there, every single guy except Michael Schofield is signed through 2021. So there's going to be some longevity along the offensive line and some continuity, which we know is definitely going to be like a main driver and a main help to his fantasy production using him, you know, continuing that efficiency in the run game. Right. Uh, we'll move on to the most electric player in the NFL. I've been 20. standing. Uh, yeah, yeah, 30 for 30. I've been standing for this guy since way before the season. It's Lamar Jackson. Uh, under the positives in my notes, I basically just said he's a god. Uh, I don't think there's much more to say beyond that. He was on par with 2018 Mahomes, uh, the MVP season that Mahomes put up last year in terms of point output. And he did that while missing one game and getting benched in the fourth quarter four times. So we know that if, if he had played out all of those those things, he would have blew Mahomes out of the water um, from last year. He was the QB1 overall, and he would have been the QB15 if you excluded all of his rushing production, and he would have been the RB24 if you excluded all of his quarterback uh, passing volume. So he's just a total stud, and this is like a once-in-a-generation type player. Um, people draw the comp to Mike Vick. I I think he's actually better than Mike Vick is, as at least he's shown so as a passer this early in his career. And he's, that's like one area where even I did not foresee. You know, I wanted to buy in on Lamar Jackson because I knew he was going to be a rushing god. And he's going to provide you that really, really safe floor, uh, being the Konami coach heat. Uh, but he killed it as a passer this year. He threw 36 touchdowns, six interceptions, 3,000 yards. Uh, and he was just lighting it up. And, you know, some people say, well, it was against bad teams, against bad teams. Well, like, dude, so what? They're NFL teams. Like, the Dolphins beat other teams at the end of the year. It's not like these guys are, you know, cakewalk, right? These are all professional players. So, and I don't even care. As long as he puts it up to production, like, I don't care how he gets there. He's getting me points. It's the points-driven game, and that's what I care about. And he finally has an offense that's built around his skill set. Uh, they're pro totally RPO-driven, and – Greg Roman's done just a fantastic job uh, as the OC there, just running the playbook for Lamar. And he has an unmatched floor-ceiling combo. Like, this guy scored less than 19 points per game one time. And he scored 28 plus 28 points or more nine times out of the 15 games he played. And all the other time he scored 20-plus. So this is just an incredible asset. Like, especially in super flex formats, you want quarterbacks that give you a floor and a ceiling because you don't want to, like, take Jared Goff or I guess the new Jared Goff was Aaron Rodgers and just put him out there and he busts like 30% of the time and gets you like QB 30. That's not what you want. You want guys that have a great floor. And if you can, you want the guys and give you a ceiling. And in terms of floor ceiling, Lamar and Mahomes are probably in their own class. Right. And what are some of the complaints people have about him? It's like, Oh, he's a running QB. So he's less durable, even though like there's really not that much evidence of this. Right. If we think of like people that got injured, like Mahomes got injured, He's not a running quarterback. Like, Brady has gotten injured. Like, Breeze got injured. Big Ben got injured. Like, this year was actually, like, apocalypse for a QB. Like, everyone was getting hurt. That's why you're sending guys like Kyle Allen and Mason Rudolph out there. Um, so, I just I just don't see it. I mean, it's a totally different NFL, right? People aren't blowing guys up anymore. You saw that in the – was it the AFC Championship game where Mahomes, like, ran it from, like, 30 yards out and the Titans players were literally afraid to touch him? Like, people are afraid of this stuff. So – and when you're really kind of got lit up, though, I'm not, I'm not going to lie about that. But that's also the biggest stage in the world. So I, I don't. Yeah, yesterday you got lit up. But like very rarely do I see Al Jacks getting blown up. Um, one, because guys are not even enough, enough to put 
their hands on him. He's literally snatching souls all day. He's breaking ankles. So I think that's just one thing where I'm not as worried. And for me, like, I care about the apex, right? If I get someone and they are league winners for like two to three years, I don't really care about the next seven to ten. That's how I think about it in terms of dynasty. Um, one of the other things is like Roman may leave. And you know what? If Roman leaves, I am like worried. That's definitely a concern because Roman's one to design the playbook for him. Uh, we know Harbaugh is not some offensive guru. Um, but they do have a playbook in place. So if he leaves, I'm, I'm hoping that they can replicate off that, right? And then the biggest thing is people are calling for regression. You know, everyone loves calling for regression. And I think that's definitely a risk because we saw that he maintained a 9% TD rate, which is absolutely absurd. Um, I think Mahomes had like a 7 or 8% last year. And, you know, Wilson had a pretty high one before that. But even if you assume that he gets cut to a 5% TD rate, which is more closer to like league average, and that drops him from 36 TDs to 20 TDs, he still would have been the QB1. Right. So like you can make you can make all the regression arguments you want, but like when you're so far above everyone else, like you everything has to go wrong for Lamar Jackson to fall off the map. And I just I just don't see it. Yeah, I think another big negative against him was people saw this playoff game when against Tennessee where he just didn't look good, right? He was throwing ducks and all that. But guess what happened in twenty eighteen against the Chargers in the playoffs? He didn't look good. And guess what he did in twenty nineteen? He looked really fucking good. So I'm not going to weigh a lot of that analysis on one game after the dude won the MVP and looked like legitimately insane, like Michael Vick times two on steroids. Um, And I think another thing, like on social media, media, a lot of people were actually serious about this. Like those Pro Bowl events when they were trying to like thread the needle and he, I think he scored like one or zero points and like Jarvis Landry scored him. People were like, this guy isn't my MVP. He can't throw a football. The dude just went out there and threw 35 touchdowns against NFL defenses week after yeah. week, week saying that you're not confident in him like being a good quarterback. And that's just, yeah. if, his, if his numbers drop legit in half, he's still the quarterback one in fantasy football. And as you said, like you get that super high floor with his running. Like running alone, he is basically a quarterback one. If, even if he sucks at passing for the rest of his career and he has that ability on the ground, you're be, you're getting like what Marcus Mariota should have been what he was early in his career, which is like a back end quarterback one who can do it not only with his luck, but we've seen him make those strides as a passer. And in his second year in the league, the dude won MVP, and he went from somebody who they didn't trust throwing the ball to making him basically like a gunslinger on low volume and pushing the ball downfield as they add weapons through the draft, which they should because all they really have at this point is Mark Andrews, uh, Hollywood Brown, who can't stay healthy, and a bunch of guys who probably run like four eight forties and have been on like 15 different teams at this point. As they add more weapons, that only helps Lamar Jackson. Maybe he doesn't run as much, but maybe his passing efficiency, maybe not the touchdown efficiency goes up, but the touchdown, um, but the passing yardage goes up, and that just helped his floor going forward. So I think a lot of the negatives can be argued away. Obviously, Robert Griffin III kind of hurt all running quarterbacks' um, ability to run without people being apprehensive about their health. But as you said, we saw a bunch of statues this year break their hands, break their knees, whatever, whatever it may be. They all got hurt this year, so... Um, just to say, because he runs the ball, he's going to get hurt. I think it's lazy analysis. And everything he's shown us just growing from year one to year two is a good window into not only his potential, but his floor going forward. He's like 23 years old. Uh, if he's not your QB1, he has to be your QB2 in terms of dynasty. And there's not much I would sell him for. Yeah, he's a, he's a QB2 right now in terms of ADP. And he started he started the year as a QB 10, which I thought was absolutely absurd. You know, people are taking Jared Goff and like Matt Ryan ahead of him. And I was like, what do you like? I don't understand what's going on. He was my, he was a top five QB for me. I didn't have him finishing as a QB one, but I've always seen him as, as that way. And the funny thing about the pro bowl thing is like, who cares, man? Like, are these guys throwing to receivers or are they throwing through like holes and buckets on the NFL field? And the funny thing about that is like, then he went into the pro bowl and he won the pro bowl MVP in the, in the real game. So like I'm I learned it football, like, Mike. What don't you understand? You can't throw <laughs> it into a bucket from 45 yards away. Yeah, like who cares? Like these guys are. He's an in-game player, and he thrives in game. So I honestly, I, I don't even care. I, I, he could have scored zero points or whatever he scored, and it literally has nothing, no bearing on my view of him. In terms of like what to do with him, I have him as a hold because buying him is impossible. Well, you're not going to buy him from anybody. Uh, the buy window for him probably shut like after week five of the regular season. Um, and I'd be I'd be open to take offers for him, uh, even as a Lamar Jackson truther. If you can get a deal where you get another stud quarterback uh, back in return plus some other stuff, that's something I consider. So, for example, if I could get like Kyler Murray plus like you know 2021, uh, like a mid 2021 or like an early 2021, something like that, those are types of deals that I'd be looking for because I also really love Kyler Murray. He's like discount Lamar Jackson. 
Um, but aside from that, like I'm not going to just dump them because of regression. Um, yeah. And I think you brought up a good point. Like, even though you want to hold these players and you don't want to sell them, their prices are super high. Always just be open to putting them on the trade block to see what you can get in return. Especially if your team is, doesn't have a lot of depth behind, you know, a few studs and you do have Lamar Jackson, even though you may be losing him and he's like a huge fantasy producer week to week, look at the opportunity cost of losing him and what you can get in return. Like your week, like your weekly fantasy projections and output with a bunch of different packages that you could get. Like obviously Kyler Murray this year wasn't the quarterback one. And I think he finished outside of QB one territory because he didn't have much to work with, but you look at the future in that offense, right? A team that wants to throw the ball a ton and a team that definitely has the opportunity to add a lot of playmakers on the outside The drop off from Lamar Jackson to him, although it might be pretty big, the other pieces you get in the deal could really help your team. So I would just say never completely take somebody off the trade block unless, you know, you have Lamar Jackson and you built really young. You have guys like McCaffrey and AJ Brown and all these young pieces and you don't need any help at that point. Uh, if you really don't need anything to benefit your team, take them off the trade block, but you should always kind of be open to offers in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of wraps up the guys we want to go in detail about. And uh, as much as you guys, I'm sure you guys have enjoyed Noah's soliloquies. We're going to go a little shorter on these other ones and just kind of knock them out. Um, so I think maybe the best way is like, Hey, I'll just like list off the name and you give your buy sell recommendation and just one quick sentence on what you think. Cool. Of course. All right, let's do it. Uh, first up, Allen Robinson, the guy that I have. Okay, well, the, the jersey fell, but I had Allen Robinson's jersey behind me. Yeah, he was a riser until you put him on your couch and he fell. But he's a guy that I'm <laughs> buying because I don't think his value is as high as it really should be. He's an alpha receiver, and although it's, you know, with a terrible quarterback, he sees the volume, he produces. He's still pretty young. I'm pretty sure he's younger than Cooper Cup. I put something out about Same age. Same age. They're both 26 years old. I think Cooper Cup's older by a couple months. Yeah, it's like you can get somebody who's a legit wide receiver one outside the top 12 receivers at that price. You got to buy him. 100%. I'm on board with you. Um, he's definitely a buy. I mean, if you just look at like his ADP, his ADP right now is wide receiver 19. He would finish the season as the wide receiver seven. So, I mean, the gap is there. And I get it. Trubisky sucks. Uh, trust me, I believe you. I know he can't throw to his left. He's just absolute trash. But even bad quarterbacks can support wide receiver ones. We've seen it with Nuke. We've seen it with others. And I'm all aboard the a Rob train. Next up, the uh, stay-at-home couch dad, Baker Mayfield. What are you thinking? <sighs> Fuck. Uh, I, I probably don't want any part of him. If it's a super flex league and somebody's putting him on the board to trade, I mean, sure, go ahead and try to grab him. One quarterback league, I'm just staying away. If his price is what it was or anything close to it heading into the year, I mean, we just saw that team completely fall apart. Obviously, with the new coaching staff, things could change, but he's not somebody I'm super high on. And the way he acts off the field, I know it's not going to translate directly to the field, but he doesn't seem like a great leader of men for what that's yeah. worth. Yeah, interesting about that last point, though, is I've been watching some of the interviews that he's been taking a part of. And, you know, take it with a grain of salt because he might just be saying what people want to hear. But he does seem like he's someone that's been humbled. And, you know, yeah. he said, like, he, said I he, agree with that. he was kind of out. like going publicly talking trash about people that talked about him. And now he's like going on an apology tour. So maybe he learned his yeah. lesson. I don't yeah, know. he's definitely that. But uh, like I said, take it with a grain of salt. I'm actually a buyer. You know, I, I like Baker from an analytical perspective. And just given how far he's fallen, I'm always trying to capitalize on these types of recency bias. He's still hella young. Um, like, give me, ba give, give me Baker over uh, Jared Goff, for example. Oh, 100%. Give, give me Baker over Aaron Rodgers, you know. Give me Baker over Matt Ryan. Give me Baker over a lot of these guys. I'm still willing to throw in the dice on him, especially for Superflex Leagues. They have a new coach. You know, Freddie Kitchens, the uh, Pop Warner coach, is moving over to the Giants, which is probably on par with the local. Good. Yeah, which is the Pop Warner team, the New York Giants. Um, so I think, I think things are looking up and I'm willing to explore to see what prices uh, I can get them at. Quick question. Baker Mayfield or Carson Wentz? Ooh, that's a tough one. I'm probably going to go with Carson just because I think they're going to add some weapons. I agree. I think he also has a decent enough rushing upside that we saw earlier in his career. And I think he's yeah. very good. It's just a lack of weapons and injuries. It's really hurting. Yeah. You got to give him that ginger discount though. Cause you know, obviously. Yeah. That Prince Harry discount also. <laughs> that Prince Harry discount. Yeah. All right. Next up. Chris, the God Godwin. What do you say, Noah? Uh, I think his price is a little bit too high for me to buy on him, especially with, you know, the quarterback situation being up in the air and not knowing how much longer Bruce Arians is going to be around coaching. So 
uh, with all that being put into consideration, obviously he's like a top, a fringe top five dynasty wide receiver. I just think that's a little bit too pricey. We can get, you can get guys of similar value later. Like I don't think Allen Robinson, he, although he's a little bit lower, I think the return you can get for an Allen Robinson, I'd much prefer to a Chris Godwin. Totally agree. Godwin's kind of in that untouchable zone now where you're basically buying him at his ceiling and he's, he's fantastic. Uh, but we don't know what they're going to do without James to crab Winston. Like that guy literally throws the ball and just doesn't care. So if they get a smarter quarterback, does it get worse? Like I have no idea. Um, so I'm totally on board with you. He's a hold. If you have him, thank you. Lucky stars. If not try and find better value elsewhere. And one of those better values is this next guy coming up, Cortland Sutton. What say you? Bye. Slam that buy button. He produced in a bad situation with three bad quarterback or two bad quarterbacks and one that looked decent enough, I guess. I look for those type of situations. We talked about it last week with the Cam Akers uh, and Jalen Rager who produce in bad situations, and that only makes you hopeful for the future. They get another weapon and really open up this offense. Cortland Sutton was basically a wide receiver one this year with wide receiver one volume. Things are looking up for the kid, and I don't think he's valued where he should be. Totally agree. He was my wide receiver two of that class. I was copping the buy on him everywhere in rookie rookie drafts. Disappointed first year, absolutely stepped up second year into that wide receiver one role, which is what you want to see. Uh, he has a size. He has he's one of the crazy like most agile wide receivers, and he's routinely mossing guys. I remember he basically retired Xavier Rhodes this season when he totally embarrassed him in that game. I don't know if you saw that game, but it was I was like, oh my god, that's sad to see. But great to see for Quentin Sutton. We're copping the buy here, BDG. Move on. Next. Cortland, wait, wait. Cortland Sutton or AJ Brown? Oh, I got. I have Cortland Sutton one above him because I've already seen Cortland Sutton in that one role with arguably trash quarterback Joe Flacco or Sacco, whatever you want to call him. Um, and you know, I'm not fully bought on Drew Locke, but we know that dude can sling it, and he's not afraid to sling it, so that, that's good. Yeah, I like Cortland Sutton a little bit better as well, just the volume, and we've seen him do it. Yeah, for sure. Next up, DJ. Chark. I don't know. I don't, I'm not buying him, I don't think. I just – the situation in Jacksonville, I'm not really a fan of. I, I don't know how else to put it. I think you don't like Minshew, man? You don't like Gochu? Dude, I love Gochu, man. <sighs> I'm kind of looking like him right now, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, dude. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I can trust in Jacksonville. I mean, I loved Keelan Cole at one point, and he broke my heart into a million pieces. So oh, my God, me too. Maybe it's a personal thing, but – uh, DJ Chark is a great receiver. I'm just not sure that – like, he was extremely boom-bust this year for as good as he was. Um, I'm not so sure what his price is. Yeah. No. He, was, uh, he was a wide receiver. He was a top 12 wide receiver from weeks, I believe, one to six or seven. And then after that, he was a weekly wide receiver 30-plus. So he went from wide receiver one to wide receiver three for the back half of the season. And part of that is just, you know, teams adjusting and, uh, you know, realizing that, hey, we got to cover this dude. Whereas in the beginning of the year, they're like, who the hell is DJ Chark? And, you know, everyone in the Dynasty community was like, forgot about him, wrote him off. He hit an ADP in February of 199 and 167 before the season started. And then now his ADP is 38 and the wide receiver 21. So he went from wide receiver 85 to wide receiver 21. Quite the jump. That's not as high as I thought he was. So maybe he isn't somebody I'm not, not trying to buy because I think I was thinking more so he was near the top 15. But at 21, I think, you know, I, I'd pull the trigger around there. Yeah, 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 for ADP. Oh, wise. But I, bet you, I bet you he's a bit more costly, though, if you try and acquire him via trade. You know, there's always yeah. that gap between ADP and, and trade value. I don't know why. Like, you know, for example, like you can – if you try and sell the 1.01, which is like Christian McCaffrey for like, you know, the second round or third round, people are like, hell no, that's stupid. But then like when you try and sell – like when you try and buy Christian McCaffrey via trade, they're like, oh, I want five first, your next born, like your a day with your mom and like everything else. So <laughs> just like it's so crazy how there's a dichotomy there. And I also think with DJ Chark, if you have him, it's probably because like, if you have him, you want to keep him because you want to like gloat that you hit that breakout candidate. So yeah, I think, yeah, yeah the, your personal connection to him is going to make him a little bit more pricey than what, you know, the number on paper says. Yeah, I took a dispersal draft. I took over like a sh orphan. Like I'm telling like dumpster status. Like I don't even know how this team was so bad, but I took it over and I drafted, uh, I took Adrian Brown and DJ Chark. So I super lucked out on them. That was before they blew up. Um, next up, uh, no knees, McNeese. James Conner, what do you think about him? No, um, no I know. If, if you have him, try to sell him. I'm not sure, like, anybody's buying him. He's fantastic when he's on the field, but that's the issue. He's ended three straight seasons injured. I'm pretty sure two on IR. Uh, you know, I think this team might invest in a running back, whether it's free agency, whether it's the draft. I don't see him being anything more than maybe, you know, a change of pace back. And he can definitely be better than that, but I'm not so sure they're going to want to hit, like, to roll him out in a roll anything bigger than that because they've seen year after year he can't really handle it. 
Yeah, remember remember when James Conner was a top five dynasty running back? That was good times. Was was uh, that actually the case? Oh my god, yeah. After that first year, everyone's like, he's better than Le'Veon Bell. Like, check out his yards after contact. Blah blah blah. I'm like, hey, you guys are crazy, man. Whatever. <laughs> um, this is why you got to like try and fade recency bias. You know, he was he started off the year as the RB eight. He was a top ten RB. Now, right now, his ADP is RB twenty two. So he's at that back end RB two. So you know, at those prices, I'm like kind of interested. But at the same time, I think there's a chance that Pittsburgh just draft someone because they're one of the few teams that can actually um, afford to draft someone. Uh, I mean, they're really only missing like a quarterback and a stable running back. We know Jalen Samuels ain't it. Like that dude can't run for his life. And, you know, the other guy's just a, just a plotter. He's just a jag. So I, I'm kind of interested, but yeah, I think he's someone I'm like kind of risky. Just somebody who, when they're on the field, they're fantastic, but they just can't string together a healthy season, which makes me extremely nervous. And the fact that they might bring in somebody through the draft uh, similar to the situation in Seattle, those are two guys I'm a little apprehensive about. Exactly, he was a, he was RB seventeen on a points per game basis, and he was the RB thirty four overall. So that kind of speaks to what you're saying. Uh, next up, his mentor uh, and friend, Le'Veon Bell. What Rough phenomenon, <laughs> Le'Veon? Bell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Climbing up your music charts, uh, he's basically J Cole plus Le'Veon Bell. What say you about him? Um, I'm seeing right now is the RB19. That's very pricey for somebody. Like, I still think he's a good running back. He's just in a terrible situation. And if, if they move on from him and he lands literally anywhere else, I'd maybe try to acquire him at that price. But dude, with Adam Gase there, <laughs> I said it early in the season, that dude's eyes go everywhere except to the end zone. Because he is not, <laughs> yeah. like, nothing about him is efficient. He, I saw a funny tweet today. They said, Ryan Tannehill won most improved player or comeback player of the year over Jimmy Garoppolo proving Adam Gase is worse than an ACL tear. So, <laughs> so whatever Adam Gase touches just turns to dust as long as he stays in New York. I actually did buy Adam uh, Le'Veon Bell earlier this offseason, so um, I'm not practicing what I preach, but I think it was at you know, a decent enough value. I don't even remember what it was uh, before. But if he does land somewhere else and you want to make that investment and hope, then sure, go and buy him. But where he is right now, I don't have any hope. And maybe Gase is gone by week three, but – I mean, Freddie Kitchen stayed around an entire season, so I have no uh, – I'm not having an optimistic outlook on that. Yeah, I don't get it, man. The NFL is just a roulette of, like, shitty, stupid coaches. I don't like the nepotism. I don't get it. It's oh. like Hugh Jackson sucked here. Let's see if he sucks somewhere else. It's like just – they just shift around like idiots, and they never work out. It's it's crazy, man. It's how bad teams stay bad, you know. And Adam Gase clearly didn't like Le'Veon Bell to begin with. I mean, they had that beef before he even signed, so – you know he doesn't like him. Um, but, I mean, if we look at the value, like, Le'Veon Bell finished as RB19 on a points-per-game basis, RB16 on a seasonal basis. So, he's kind of that high-end RB2. Uh, he's getting old, and we know he's got a ton of injuries and a ton of touches. I mean, that dude touched more balls than Rachel Starr. So, we know that he's definitely yeah. up there. Yeah, so, <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, I think if you are to buy them, don't buy him now. Wait till you're – closer to the draft and you can like maybe swing like a second like a second and a third from at those kind of prices i'm i'm all aboard but you know i'm not trying to invest too heavily on on old dudes all right next up one of my favorite players of all time odell beckham jr what are you doing with him uh let's see where his adp is at right now the wide receiver eight so it's still pretty high um I still believe in the kid. I mean, he had, like, a lot of things go wrong. He was very quiet for what his, like, persona typically is this year, which I think is a step in the right direction maturity-wise. Um, obviously, Freddie Kitchens is gone. And although I'm not too high in Baker, I mean, Odell still saw the targets. The touchdowns just weren't there. He actually, like, strung together a healthy season. He definitely still has that top five upside. And what is he, like, 27 years old? Still mm -hmm. in his prime. It should be a good offense, all things considered. I'd probably buy him because I would venture to say his price is actually lower than what his ADP suggests. Especially um, if you had Odell all season, you're probably very disappointed in what you had. Yeah. I'm seeing guys getting Odell for single 2021st. So if, if that's happening, I'm all aboard, dude. Because, you know, your dream, you're, in your dream scenario, you want Odell Beckham with that 2021st. So, like, I'm taking him above every single wide receiver and probably every single running back. Um like, this is a generational talent. And what people don't realize is, like, when you change, and I didn't, you know, I definitely am guilty of this too. When you change teams as a wide receiver, that is, like, a huge jump. And um, Addison Hayes, if you guys don't follow him on Twitter, you totally should. He's another writer at DLF. He put out a cool article 
that looked at wide receivers their first year switching team versus second year. And they always improve in the not always, but most of the time they improve in the second year because it takes time to like understand the system, work with Baker, understand timing and all that stuff. So I'm expecting him to take a step up this year. I don't think he'll be uh, the elite Odell that we saw from like three years ago, but I do think he'll have a bounce back. And just given the recency bias, uh, I think he can get him for pretty cheap. Yeah, and we saw that happen with Amari Cooper this year where he was basically wide receiver one, like the, almost the wide receiver one until he got injured. So, yeah, that's, yep. that's a point in the right direction for Odell. Yep. Next up, the fall from grace, Todd Arthritis Gurley. What are you going to do with this man? He's RB16 right now. I'm not buying him. I just – I was basically all off of him this season because of his knees, and he proved me wrong, but I'm not betting on that to happen again. I don't know. I don't I don't trust somebody with the knees of an, 80, of an 80-year-old to – be an RB1. Yeah. yeah, look, I took him. I have him in two leagues, one in the BDG Dynasty League OG one where I'm trying to go for a three-peat. Uh, he's, like, not sellable right now because, I mean, nobody wants to touch him. So you kind of have to hold him if you have him. If you can sell him for, like, a late first, like the 1.9 to, like, 1.10 range, uh, I think that's cool. And maybe when you're on the clock, you can explore – buying him at like high second like very low first prices if you're a contender because at the end of the day he's still 25 and I think during the end of the stretch like he kind of like took a step up and the Rams really started lying on him so there's still some juice to squeeze there but uh there's not much juice to squeeze in his knees so I wouldn't rely on him for too long yeah and a lot of his production came off of touchdowns this year and I'm not so sure that's really repeatable especially if this offense is taking that step back yeah, yeah, we're going to cover that in our regression video. I, I mean, I dug into this pretty deeply, and spoiler alert, it's not sustainable. Uh, last guy we have on the list is a huge riser, Mark Andrews, someone that I was really high on in the offseason. Uh, he won the uh, the country's, like, the nation's best tight end award. I feel what it's called uh, in, in college. And uh, he was surprisingly the second tight end drafted by the Baltimore Ravens behind uh, 35-year-old Hayden Hurst at the time. Uh, yeah, look so at him. he's a baseball phenomenon too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what what are your thoughts on Andrews? Um, he's currently the tight end three, so his value can't really get much higher behind like who Kittle and Kelsey at this point. I think yep. that like positional wise, he's a little bit too expensive. But um, I don't really know what the price is like the going rate for the tight end three is right now, especially if it's not a tight end premium league. But if you're a tight end away from having a really solid roster, I would go ahead and acquire him because. He's going to be in his prime while his quarterback is in his prime, and he's basically the wide receiver one in Baltimore. Obviously, they could add more weapons, but he is a red zone monster, and despite the limited snap share, he's used every time he is on the field. So uh, he's somebody I'm extremely high on, and I think he's a very good talent. Yeah, he's basically priced exactly where I have him, and and you you mentioned something that, that I think is really important to cover. You talked about snaps, and when it comes to tight ends, we don't care about snaps as much because a lot of tight ends are on the field for blocking and we don't get points for blocking. Right. So what you want to focus on you know point per pancake league. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't have that. A kid would be the 1.01 in that easily. Uh, but what you want to focus on is the routes that he runs per drop back. So basically like when the quarterback is dropping back to pass, is he running a route or is he blocking? And from that perspective, like he's in the league company, he's, he's like a high percentage of routes run per drop back. And like I said, like you said, he's expensive. Uh, if he's that last piece to get you over the hump, I would pull the trigger. Um, and if you have him, hold him because tight ends in Dynasty are incredibly undervalued. It's not like redraft where you can go to the waiver wire and snatch up some tight end streamer and hope he gets a touchdown. I like when I build Dynasty teams, I really like to build around an elite tight end. Like I hate having teams with like crappy tight ends I have to stream and try and guess. Like it's a huge disadvantage because it's just like it just feels so bad when you put in like. Ryan Griffin into your tight end slot after he blew up and then he goes like one catch for 10 yards after. Imagine like trading for Tyler Eifert four years ago and him being your only tight end. You're like, he's going to return value. The dude was a beast. I think he went to Notre Dame or something. And then yeah. I don't even know if he's still alive anymore. <laughs> yeah. He's got that. Uh, he's got that Mohawk or the, is it a Fohawk or Mohawk? I don't know. He's got, I he's got, he's got way too much years. money. I don't know. <laughs> he's just got way too much money to rock hair like that. You know, like he's not like our man Noah here rocking. Yeah, I have no money. So that's why I'm rocking hair. Like this. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so anyways, that, that kind of wraps up our, our full list. Um, if you have any questions, comments, drop it below. Uh, before we sign off here, though, we do want to cover one thing off. Every week, uh, Noah and I are going to go through the Twitter trend of the week. So what people are blabbering about on Twitter and what's all the hype and just kind of give our thoughts and, you know, let you know what the dynasty implications are. Yeah, trust uh, us. We hate Twitter as much as you guys, but it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good place to get some engagement. So 
we're all over it. Free entertainment, man. Uh, and this week's topic is hashtag RVs don't matter. What say you, Noah? Yeah, this is basically centered around the Super Bowl where Damian Williams obviously capped off the game with a touchdown and all these running backs don't matter people. Um, no names. I'm not going to name anybody, obviously, but um, they were advocating for Damian Williams to win the Super Bowl MVP, which I think is doesn't make sense. First off, if running backs don't matter. Why is he going to be named the best player in the Super Bowl when Patrick Mahomes was the reason why those running lanes were open and he had like one big run all game and his receiving touchdown was because Mahomes earlier in the game, you know, bootlegged out right and he like did a double fake. He like AI crossed whoever was on the outside. He fell to the ground. He walked into the end zone. That's the only reason why Damian Williams scored. He did the same exact play except he threw it that time. He walked in. So I think if you're rooting for the running backs don't matter and the fact that, you know, obviously he's an undrafted player. So you're happy that you see two undrafted running backs lead the backfield in both Super Bowl teams. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive to want him to be the Super Bowl MVP. Yeah, dude, I I don't get that at all. Anyone that watches the game, to me, like it's I don't think it's a contest. It's definitely Mahomes because he's the one that won, right? Like if you take Damian Williams out of that game, I I'm not even sure nothing they lose. changes. Nothing Darwin changes. Thompson almost scored a touchdown. I mean, yeah, like nothing changes. And you know, I, I'm actually in, in the middle. You know, I don't think it's as extreme as everyone's making out to be. I don't think it's RBs don't matter. I think like if I, RBs didn't matter, Trent Richardson would still be in the league. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Trent Richardson, dude. Legendary vision. Um, I think it's more so that RBs matter less, right? It comes down to opportunity cost. And I've, you know, I've tweeted about this a lot. It's just that the reason why you don't take a running back in the first round is because there's so many other positions that have higher impact on your win probability. And you can get really talented running backs in the second, third, and even fourth rounds. And that's like what it comes down to. You don't want to pay Saquon Barkley a rookie contract in the millions when you can get Darius Geis uh you know granted he blew out his knee but you know assuming he was healthy when you get Darius Geis for like a million bucks so that, that's like kind of the argument that I come down to but we know that RBs matter like to some degree right like you can't watch the game and tell me Derrick Henry sucks like I can't do that I can't. Uh, it doesn't work but yeah, I can't do it <laughs> yeah. yeah you can't tell me the game and uh, you can't watch CMC and tell me it doesn't matter like I, I can't make that case but I, I do think it matter but from a fantasy perspective RBs absolutely do matter and you know this is coming from someone that was a pretty stout zero RB drafter. I did that this year. I'll let you guess how that turned out in a couple of my leagues. Um, great. Not great. Not good. Uh, but I think going into this year, like I've done my dynasty wide receiver full ranks, and you'll see mine and Noah's and Nick's coming out in the draft guide. Uh, just a quick plug right there. But what I've noticed is like there's so much talent at wide receiver, uh, even before accounting for rookies. Like there's like 30 something wide receivers, especially in dynasty because age matters and age pushes really talented production down the ranks. Like that's how you get AJ Brown at wide receiver 11. Then you have Robert Woods, who's a fringe wide receiver one down at wide receiver 27. You, you can, can tell build... Lockett. He's probably near wide receiver 30 and that dude's yeah, been exactly. wide receiver one. Near wide receiver three. You can buy wide receiver one, wide receiver two production for wide receiver three prices because of youth. And that's just, that's like something that I'm going to be doing this year, targeting those late round guys and building running backs first, because there's only about, I'd say 18, like including the rookies, assuming they land in good spots, good running backs that you really want to start on a weekly basis. So running backs don't matter, or I guess running backs matter less for real life, but running backs absolutely matter for Dynasty. They absolutely matter if you want to win. And if you want to win, which is what we're all about here at Big Dogs, winning and bunk bets, uh, you're going to want to draft some, draft some running backs early. Need that. That is the beauty of Dynasty Fantasy Football. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. If you like the video, give us a thumbs up. If you didn't, hit us with a thumbs down and tell us what we can improve upon. Maybe it's my Shakespearean X, as you said, soliloquies where I talk for five minutes about Austin Eckler. Um, <laughs> I can try to work on that. Um, if you want the draft guide, we have it linked above at bigdogsdraftguide.com. If you want to join the Slack channel to get involved in Dynasty Leagues, if you have never been before, or you just want to talk about rookie prospects, I'll link that below our Slack channel. We have a little invite. Uh, you can give us pictures of your roster and we'll break it down in future shows or trade targets or whatever you want to do. But I think that about wraps it up today. Hope you Yeah, one last thing. Uh, one last thing. If you want to continue seeing our boy Noah in his Rafa Nadal hairdo, please comment below because uh, I think that'd be great for the channel. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody already clicked off by now, so hopefully I won't see too many of those. But uh, that about does it for today. Uh, leave a like for the hair, I guess, even though it's kind of garbage. Who says? Oh.